All right, class, uh, today we're going to take some time to learn about the scientific method. Uh, this is going to be our first online set of notes, and there's a couple kind of things that I do want to show you a little bit about notes in general. Um, first of all, you'll always see the title right here. Uh, when you start your notes, make sure that's what the title of your document is and what your, your notes are titled. Also, you might notice some page numbers right here. Uh, those pages indicate uh, if you have a textbook or borrow a textbook, uh, what this, where this information is coming from. Also, fun fact, this is a picture of me when I was a kid. Not really. Um, I didn't have that long hair. All right, so a couple quick things here uh, to look at when you look at this screen where your notes are that you might want to look at first. Uh, these are your controls to click through. So if you're looking through this maybe on a different slide or the unrecorded slide, just so you can click around and see what this is. Also, if you open up the one that's not a recording, not a video, uh, that's linked on the web page, if you click right here, it'll have the list of all the slides. So it's really easy to go back and double check uh, you know, a step or a slide that you missed. Also, uh, if you click on this gear, you have some options uh, to print the notes as slides or if you want to download it as a PDF uh, to save and have a copy of that with you, uh, you can do that as well. So let's take some time and uh, get started. Uh, the first thing I want to bring up is a video. Uh, this video highlights why the scientific method is important, specifically when it comes to observation. So take a second and we're going to take a second and watch this. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is third. But did you see the moonwalking bear? Go! Now the main reason I show this video uh, is because I want you to think a little bit about all the things that are out there that you might not be seeing, uh, things that you're missing. Um, and, and that's kind of a key point to science in general is looking a little bit deeper and trying to find meaning in some of the concepts or, you know, locations that you might not be used to or, you know, things that go unseen. So we're going to talk a lot about observation and using that to develop thoughts. Um, and ideas as we discover the scientific method. So the scientific method, um, important for a number of reasons, um, because first of all, it's an organized plan for gathering, organizing, and communicating data. Um, the scientific method in general uh, is used by scientists to explain and with reliability be able to back up what they're saying. Anyone can make a statement, but with the scientific method, it's a tool for scientists to be able to back up what they're saying. So that's really, really important, uh, especially as you start doing lab reports. Every statement that you make, you need to back up with data, all right? You need to back it up with the data that you figured out in your experiment. If you're not doing that, then you're not necessarily following the scientific method. Also, it's a plan for solving a problem. Uh, you can use the scientific method as a way to problem solve and find solutions to answers. Um, think about maybe um, you know, a NASA scientist trying to land something on Mars. You know, that's a problem. They have to go through the scientific method and test and, you know, simulate things to make sure that it works correctly. Uh, so it's a plan for solving a problem. Uh, and we're going to go through six basic steps. In other classes, you might learn different steps. Uh, this has a little bit of wiggle room, but these are the six steps that you will be tested on. And it generally goes through the same process. Um, the first one is observation. So every scientific experiment starts with an observation. And this is basically what you perceive with your senses, uh, whether this is smell or taste or sight or touch. Uh, these are things that you're looking around and you're finding. Um, so we're actually going to run an experiment as you go through this. So what I want you to do at the end of each one of these steps, I'm going to ask you a couple questions. Uh, so what you're going to need to do right now 
uh, you can pause this when you go do this, but you need to get two sheets of paper. Uh, one, just a regular sheet of paper, and another one, any other size that you can find that might be you know, smaller. Uh, and what I want you to do is I want you to see how many times you can fold that piece of paper in half, all right? So go ahead and pause the video right now. In each one of those, I want you to make an observation and tell me how many times you can fold each one of those sheets of paper. Go ahead and pause the video now and do that. Now that you've made some observations, uh, what's a question that you can form from that paper folding experiment? And the key thing though, is that this needs to be based on observations. So based on that little test that you just did, what's a question you can write about folding a piece of paper in half? So take a second now, and I want you to write a how or why question uh, in your notes on this paper folding experiment. You know, maybe how many times or why can you fold so many times? So go ahead and pause the video right now and write your question. After you form that question, you're going to develop your hypothesis. And a hypothesis is a proposed answer to your question. So you wrote a question during the last step. Now what we're going to do is you're going to develop an answer for that question. All right. It's usually made after doing some initial research. This is based on your observations that you did. You did that in step one. Uh, and sometimes you're going to need a testable benchmark, something that you can pair, something that will act as your, you know, if it goes past this mark, then yes, your hypothesis is correct. If it goes below, maybe your hypothesis is incorrect. So something that you're going to be able to test against to be able to say if your hypothesis is incorrect or not. So using your question, go ahead and write a hypothesis to what you did in step two. So at this point, you've made an observation, you've developed a question, now I want you to write a question based on that hypothesis. So go ahead and pause the video right now and do that. Now step four is when we start to test this hypothesis. So this is where the actual experiment takes place. So you're going to develop a set of repeatable methods. So these are methods that you can repeat over and over again. Someone can take your methods and be able to duplicate what you're doing. Now the goal is to test your hypothesis by collecting this data. And there are a couple key definitions here uh, when you're writing your methods that you're going to need to write down or understand in part of your experiment. The first one being the independent variable. Now in your experiment, the independent variable is what you are changing in the experiment. The dependent variable is the outcome of the independent variable. This is your measurement. So an independent variable is what you're changing. The dependent variable is what's caused because of that change. A quick tip for this is your dependent variable is always going to be something that you can count or measure or something that you're writing down on a data table. So the independent variable, you're going to be able to fill that out before the experiment. The dependent variable is something that you're going to collect after you do the experiment. And then you have constants and controls. A constant and control this is what's staying the same from one experiment to the next. So in an experiment, these are always staying the same. And ideally, you really only have one independent variable, one thing that you're changing. Because if you don't watch your constants and controls right here, you don't know whether something that you didn't control or keep constant is causing this dependent variable. Ideally, you want whatever you're changing here to cause this change in the dependent variable. If you don't have constants and controls, you don't know if this data is correct. So let's take a second right now, and I want you to think about what are the variables in your paper folding experiment. So go ahead and write down um, on your sheet of paper or in the notes that you're typing. I want you to pause the video and see if you can write down your independent variable, your dependent variable for this paper folding experiment. There should only be one for each one of these. And then what are some of the constants and controls, things that you're going to keep the same from experiment to experiment? Go ahead and pause the video and fill those out now. Now the fifth step, after you've collected that data, it's time to analyze that. So you're going to take that data, and a lot of times you're going to put it into some type of graph. Uh, this can either be a bar graph or a line graph. And this is a way for you to interpret your data and kind of make sense of it. It's also an opportunity, too, if you're going to run any statistics. These are averages, means, uh, what is your max, what's your minimum. Uh, this is when you're going to do some type of mathematical assessment when you're analyzing the data. 
Now, the reason why I put bar and line graph here is because you need to really, really think about the type of graph that you're making and how it relates to your data. A bar graph is usually used if you've got categories and you're doing counts. And a line graph is usually used when you're showing trends over maybe time or over a distance. You're trying to see how something changes over a period. A bar graph, again, is usually just for counting uh, groups and categories. So if we have, let's say, a line graph here, and this one is showing velocity versus time. So this is showing you how the velocity or speed is changing over a series of time. So this is a line graph for that reason. On a line graph, it's really important that you kind of think about where your axes or what your axes are labeled. So on a line graph, your dependent variable will always be your, on your y-axis. Your independent variable is always going to be on your x-axis. So take a second right now, and I want you to think about with your paper folding experiment. First of all, are you going to use a bar or a line graph? And then also make sure, go ahead and make a graph or maybe write down what would be on your y-axis or what would be on your x-axis um, for your graph. Also, I want to note real quick that on a line graph or any graph that you make, you always need a title. You always need to have your number range. You also need to have what the variable is and the units that you're measuring in. If you don't have the units that you're measuring in, I don't know if that's in seconds, that car might be going, you know, 10 meters per second over, you know, one hour or one minute or one second. So you need to really make sure that you're writing down the units that you're measuring in. So again, go ahead and pause this and I want you to create or write down what your graph would be. Now in the sixth step, that's when we write our conclusion. This is where we're going to readdress our question and our hypothesis. So in your conclusion, you need to write about, does your data support your hypothesis? If it does, you just made a scientific discovery. If it doesn't, you need to revise and make a new hypothesis and test again. So just to reiterate this, your data has to be, your data either accepts or rejects your hypothesis. And you need to use your graph and or statistics to be able to explain this and back that up. Again, if you're not backing up your conclusion with statistics or graph or data, that conclusion has no meaning. Also, uh, you need to explain a little bit of how your experiment can be improved. This might be in errors in your methods. This might be in um, you know, mistakes that you made. Uh, maybe there was something that you didn't keep constant or under control, and that's going to cause some error. So after that, you're going to move into what are some further experiments you can conduct based on what you learned. So go ahead and think a little bit about your paper experiment. Uh, What's a conclusion that you can draw about paper and relating to when you're folding it in different size pieces of paper, um, how many folds it can do? So go ahead and based on your experiment you just ran, uh, back that up with some data too. So maybe you folded a couple different sizes, maybe a full size, maybe a small size, maybe a really, really tiny sheet of paper. Um, go ahead and take a second to write down uh, what your conclusion would be for that. Now, we're going to take this to the next level, and I, you know, I really like the Mythbusters because generally when they're testing something like this, they're going to go to the extreme and really, really take it to the max. So you probably discovered a pretty fine limit on how many times you can fold a piece of paper. So let's see if we can break that limit, because the myth generally is you can only fold a piece of paper in half seven times. Let's see if we can break that. Back over at NASA, our team is finding out that folding a football field-sized piece of paper isn't exactly a breeze. For instance, the fact that it turns into a giant windsock with the littlest bit of a breeze, there's air trapped underneath it. But they managed to rein in the billowing parachute without any tears for an official fold one. Let it fall. Pull the slack. Oh, that was beautiful. They reposition for the next crease. We're going to fold that direction. It's like trying to fold the world's biggest bed sheet. It's starting to, it's crumpling in weird ways. It's not folding smoothly. 
but the team manages to smooth out the wrinkles and make folds two, three. Hey, notice we're all getting a little closer. Four, five. Everybody to this side for six. And six. Neat and tidy tuckings. It's actually like an airbag. However, with each pass, the additional layers make it harder to heave over. And at fold seven, everyone and everything is starting to puff. That's a lot of air. Uh, yeah, and it's not uh, going down. There it is. Yeah, push your foot. Seven is squashed out. Now, the team is about to go for eight. If they achieve this, they will bust the seven paper fold myth. See how everybody's very quiet? because we're all anticipating busting this myth. We folded it seven times. We're about to go for number eight. Looking good. I think we're gonna do it. The paper tries to dig in its heels, but is losing its grip. Come on! <laughs> and we did it! Yeah! Eight! That is eight! Eight! It sure feels satisfying to beat a paper myth to a pulp. If you draw a line all the way down, you'll be able to intersect every layer, and that is a true eight folds. And that busts this myth. There's no stopping our out-of-control paper pushers now. If it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. Carry trucks in a giant rolling pin to flatten this piece of puff pastry some more. As smooth as rolled dough, it folds back easy as pie. Oh, God. Nine. Nine! To achieve double digits, the paper is too heavy for the team to lift themselves, so they stick a fork in it. Drive in. Drive in. Oh. That is a definite ten. Topping ten is going to be tough. Thanks to their buddy Exponential Growth, the paper is now 1,024 layers thick. It takes every ounce of strength they have to bend it. You got it? That feels like an honest 11 to me. Nice! Yeah! yeah! I love it! <laughs> Not only did they bust seven folds, they turned it up all the way to 11. You definitely put this one to bed. Absolutely. Well, as far as, as our definition for the myth goes is the fold, we've got it long, we've got it flat. If we do any bit more, it's just going to be a semicircle. We got 11 folds of a football-sized piece of paper. We busted a myth, and we're going to go home before the sun completely goes down. 11 folds. I didn't think it was possible. Should we go to the NASA gift shop? Sure. Yeah. All right. So... Through this process, you took some time. Uh, you learned about the six steps of the scientific method that we're going to be going through. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you know, make sure you write them down. And then when we talk about this next class, we'll spend a couple minutes kind of just briefly going over this. Uh, make sure you write those down uh, so you can remember and we can take some time to kind of clear up any misconceptions that you have. Uh, I will tell you this. When we take our quiz on the scientific method, a couple big mistakes that I noticed that people miss uh, is... When we go to our testing hypothesis, uh, when we look at these definitions, what our independent and dependent variable is, identifying those. So make sure you really, really understand what an independent and dependent variable is. Uh, remember, independent variable is what you're changing in the experiment, what you are physically changing from experiment to experiment. The dependent variable is going to be the result of that change. So it's usually a count or something that you're tallying. Also, when we do our analysis of the data. Again, on the bar graph, make sure you have your independent and dependent variables on the correct axes. If you flip those and you mix those up, um, you're gonna miss points on that. So those are two areas I can tell you right now, people make a lot of mistakes. Also, a really, really common mistake is in the conclusion. And the big one is backing it up with data. Does your data support your hypothesis? If you can't back it up with data, then you really didn't answer your hypothesis, so you need to use that data you collected um, to be able to answer that, okay? So again, make sure if you have any questions, you ask me about them tomorrow in class or next time you have class period, you can also email me if you want. Go ahead and go back and look at some of these notes uh, if you need to catch up on anything. Thank you.